by the way, and and to our listeners, um, I I love like whenever you you always the first to know about certain things that are happening in like the streaming world, especially. And uh, I always feel like when Mike's posting about it, like, okay, I got to go pay attention to this because <laughs> because I wouldn't have known it otherwise. I was always find out like when Title has a new pitching service or Amazon does. Mike tells me, so I appreciate that. Well, you know that appreciation extends to a number of other people because one thing I've always done is I I don't necessarily want to be the first. And I definitely don't want to be the only voice putting out this information. So I've always been encouraging everyone else, tell your audience, tell your friends, tell your peers, you don't need to credit me for it. This is public information. And um, as a result, I've had people texting me, emailing me saying, hey, Mike, did you know that this new feature just launched? Sometimes I don't. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's cool. Yeah. And not only that, but, you know, I, I didn't expect this at the start, but there's friends at the platforms that will say, hey, Mike, we've launched this new feature today. We're really proud of it. And I'll go, great. Let me play around with it. I'll write something up. And it's cool because I can just bounce it off them and just say, look, I want to make sure what I'm saying here is accurate. Right. And that an artist will be able to do this following the steps. And yeah, you know, so that's been incredibly helpful. And um it's nice to know that if I, you know, have some time off from posting this, there's plenty of other people that are sharing it. Um, sure. Yeah. There's lots of other voices out there. So that's yeah. great to see. That's a good point. Okay. So first question I want to ask you, um, and this is kind of more of a high level question, but it is the, where are we at today as a society when it comes to singles versus albums? Like, I'm an album guy. I'm, I'm sure you have albums you dig and I like vinyl. And um, I, in fact, my favorite artists come out with singles. I might sample it for a little bit, but I, I tend to like to wait until the album comes out. But I don't think I'm the norm. I Maybe I'm the norm for my generation and, and generations beyond me. Um, but there are a lot of people today who uh, love singles, uh, uh, music fans. And the interesting thing about my own like dichotomy, the own, my own contradiction is that as an artist, I like singles because I feel like it's another kick at the can, like another pitch to Spotify, another chance. It's a way to feed the beast just to keep, you know, putting music out there. And yeah. I also like it as a way to kind of maybe say, okay, this song isn't right for an album, but I still think it's great. I want to share it with people. So where are we at with like singles versus albums? Yeah. And, you know, to add to your point, I love albums. I always have. Um, I worked in music stores many, many years ago and an album would come out. And for me, that was the best because yeah. I had something to look at, something to read. And I had something that was going to hold me for that hour or, <laughs> you know, hour and 20 minutes if you max out the time on the CD. <laughs> and, um, you know, then the exciting things like playing past the last track or rewinding the first track to find hidden tracks and just all of the excitement <laughs> that came with that. And then having something you can physically hold and jump in your friend's car and, and play it and yeah, know sure. that no one can take that away from you unless they physically take that CD away <laughs> um, or that record. Or, that or scratch tape. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely some times where I saw one on someone's coffee table out of the case and yeah. <laughs> it can almost end a friendship. Um, but not to age myself. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> We're yeah. talking about albums in the streaming world. And um, yeah, I'm still a big fan of albums on streaming. Um, the reason being that I know that my next hour or so is, you know, accounted for. Like <laughs> I'm going to press play and go on this journey that the artist has created. They've yeah. chosen the order. There's probably things in the album that weren't made as with the intention of being singles. They weren't made for social media. They weren't made for anything. They were just the artist wanted to make it. And I love hearing those tracks because mm -hmm. you know the, the worst thing is when an artist just doesn't put something out because they don't know where it fits. And I think everything can fit on an, on an album. You know, it's your work. No one should ever take that away from you. Um, as for releasing singles, you know, the ideally what I do, what I encourage other artists to do, obviously it's their choice. Um, but I say keep releasing singles. You know, keep up that consistency. You've finished a song, you're excited about it. 
Let's start planning on getting it out to the world. Let's not wait for that album. Anything could happen between now and then. <laughs> um, you know, that song needs to be out in the world and it gets its own time to shine. That's you know, right. as you mentioned, there's albums and there's singles and the same amount of work goes into promoting both of them in some cases. Um, so do you want to promote 15 songs at once or would you rather promote each song individually and spread that out? And not only that, but each song deserves to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. It's not just about opportunities that we're pitching for. It's, I made something. I've put it out in the world. Let's give it some time for everyone to discover it and enjoy it. And I want to spend some time talking about it. You know, it's not just, I put it out and hope for the best. It's, I'm yeah. going to talk, I'm going to talk you through the story of how this got made. And not everyone is going to see that one post that you do on social media. So continually telling people about it. Um, I still have it today where there's artists that I follow on streaming platforms and I'll see a post on on their socials about an album or a single or an EP they released a few months ago. That's the first time I've heard of it. Wow. And so then I go and listen. Yeah. So um, giving it time to breathe definitely matters. Yeah. I know that everyone thinks that as soon as they release that single, it's going to immediately take off and do what it's going to do but that's not the reality um so yeah the short answer is keep releasing singles and eps and build up towards that album yeah. and then those tracks that don't necessarily work as a single include them on the album for the fans they're going to appreciate it for sure i do i that's great advice. I actually have to ask you some advice here because of something I was just thinking about last night. And while we're on the topic of albums, one of the things I love to do as an artist, as a producer making a record, is I like having songs on an album bleed together. It's like, I, I just have a fetish for it. I love it when other artists do it. There's some bands out there who do it phenomenally where you've pressed, you know, you've dropped the needle on side A and the music doesn't stop till the end of side A. I love that yeah. feeling, but it creates a huge problem in playlisting if I just take that wave file out because there's a, a credible way where you can split the wave files so that when they're playing in iTunes or on Spotify, it, there is, it's gapless, you know, uh, seamless playback. Yep. But if that song is placed on a playlist, then what happens is when somebody's listening to it, <clears throat> the, the ending of like the fade out of whatever's happening, it ends abruptly or just something or the next track starts. So what do I do? Because I have a song where I, re I really want it to be a single that will come out three months before the album. But when it's on the album, it has some kind of granular noise leading into the next song. So what do I do? Um, so I, I actually did this with my friends, our debut album, Date Night, um, yep. self-titled um, album. We wanted to do exactly that. You know, the... The other two, the other two guys in the group um, play sax, play, play piano, play bass guitar, play trumpet, and they were like, you know, um, I really just kept feeling the song, and after after you know everything stopped, I just started playing, and it created this fun little interlude for the end of the track, and it goes through about forty five seconds, and I heard it, and I go, that's really cool, but that's not going to work on a playlist. So what we did was the interlude is an extension of the track, but it's a completely separate track. So mm. when people playlist the song, I can say song or track, but you know, when sure, people yeah, playlist yeah. the song, um, they get the song from start to finish. And if you listen on the album, that song finishes. And then the next song after that is the interlude. And a really crazy thing happened. I, you know, I said, guys, let's not name these as interludes. It's still 45 seconds of music. Like, yeah. In some cases, there's still some little hints of the vocal from the vocalist. And of course, they get credited on that too. And then what happened was people started taking those interludes and placing them in the middle of their own playlist as like a transition. So no there's way. like coffee shops out there that are like, oh, we're going from like, you know, new disco down to more like um, soul. And, yeah. you know, we're going to use this as a way to transition in That's our playlist. That's so cool. And and the other cool thing about it is when we first launched the album, on Spotify in particular, you could see the stream counts. So we could see, oh, 10,000, you know, on average, 10,000 people have listened to every track on the album, including the interludes. It's safe to assume that that's that many people 
have listened to the album in its entirety versus just right. going to that song. Right. Um, you just made an extra 10,000 streams too with that decision. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't, <laughs> you know, it's not like we, at the time, you know, this was 2016. It's not like we were thinking that in, oh, right. in any way we were gaming the system. Like Good these point. Yeah. interlude songs were between 40 to 60 seconds. Um, you know, obviously if we were gaming it, they would be 31 seconds. 31. <laughs> um, <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, you know, and that was fun because, from doing that and knowing that it worked, um, I was able to tell other artists, hey, you made it the way you you made it. I don't want to mess with that. But if you want to be considered for more playlists, yeah, here's, an, here's a solution where you can still keep that fun interlude, that, you know, that commentary, whatever it right. is in the album without missing on, m- missing out on some playlists. Right. Okay. That's really interesting. And that's a great idea. Now, let me ask you one other way and and if this would work. So if I release a single where the interlude is faded off, the album, the song ends just normally because I want to increase my chances of more playlists without something sounding weird. Um, And then when the album comes out, I re-upload the album, but that song now has the transition attached to the end. I'm using the same ISRC code, or maybe I'm using a new ISRC code. Do you see any problem with that? Will the new WAV file replace the old one? <clears throat> yeah, I. if you're going to attach that interlude to that one track um, with the same ISRC, it's the timing's going to be different. That's right. You know, the, yeah, looking at the audio, it's going to be different. So um, that create problems. cause some confusion. Or in some cases, it could be flagged as, hey, someone's uploading something different, saying it's yeah. something that already exists. Yeah. You know, um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. I would say, you know, I, I like the separate track for the interlude. And yeah. not only that, but I look at a lot of albums I listened to growing up where um, I won't name names because I, <laughs> I love them, but um, they had a lot of talking tracks in between. Yeah. And in the... You know, at the time, you would press the skip button. Yeah. Um, whereas on a playlist, if that talking is at, you know, the last minute of the song, like, it's fun to listen to once or twice, but every time you listen to that song, you don't necessarily want to hear that. Yeah. Um, you know, I've even seen some examples of artists going back through their catalog and separating that out so that their music is more accessible on a playlist because they don't want people to hear that song in a playlist and skip it when the talking starts. Yeah. I, I, anytime what I'm referring to here is like, you know, just like little bits of noise, like what you were talking about with that sax solo and stuff. I completely agree. Like, um, you know, commentary or skits. I I can't, you know, uh, they're really cool to listen to and they're little monologues too. You know, there's some great records out there where the monologue is phenomenal. It's moving. It's, it's a statement. Um, but it's like, I really only need to hear this two or three times. And then yeah. it's like, I don't need to hear this long Neil Armstrong or Martin Luther King speech that's like 30, 45 seconds before the song starts, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. Okay, I'll move on from that. I think that's a great point, but I, w- I just wanted to ask you about that. Let's yeah. go Let's go back to the single. So um, if you had a single mastered today, and we're talking the middle of February... When would you release it? Okay. I mean, I'm, instead of saying a date, I'll say time, a time frame. So yeah. you've got the master, you're stoked, you've got the artwork, everything looks great, um, and it's a single, and you're not, let's say, Taylor Swift or Beyonce, <laughs> um, which, I mean, some of you may be at that some level. Of the, some of our great, listeners are, yep, yep. <laughs> Thank- <laughs> well, thanks for getting your team to listen. But um, for all the other artists in the world, I I would definitely give yourself four weeks. Okay. And you know, the very first thing you would do is you would you would go, okay, artwork is great, master is done. I'm I'm really happy with where this is at. It's not perfect because nothing is, but it's ready for the world. <laughs> Let's upload it to our distributor. I would set it the release date four weeks in the future. Mm-hmm. So, um, and the reason for that is, is some distributors can take up to a week to approve the song, to deliver it to the streaming platforms, which means you've now got three weeks left. 
Um, three weeks out, you know, you've got time to react if anything went wrong, if the artwork wasn't right, or you get a comment about the audio or something like that. I mean, I've seen examples of artists where they've delivered the audio and they didn't realize that there was 20 seconds of silence at the end of the track because they just pressed play and listened to the master and were like, yep. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So they had to go back and trim it and yeah. um, put it back out. Um, then three weeks out, all going well, um, you would log into all of the four artist platforms. So, for example, Spotify for artists, Amazon Music for artists, they have submission forms where if you haven't released a song before, it's not a remix for another artist, it's a new song that you've created or a new cover that you've created, you should be okay. Uh, you can go in and fill out those forms. Like, And everyone thinks that this is just to get on a playlist, uh, on an editorial playlist. And the reality is now in 2024, it's not as much about playlists as much as it is just being discoverable on mm these streaming apps. And what I mean by that is people are getting served music through algorithmic playlists, stations, uh, personalized editorial playlists that change for each listener. Um, a lot of people just press play, listen to one album, and then they keep getting served other music. Um, so you want to make sure that you're part of that other music as well, so that when a similar artist finishes playing, your new song might get served up to those listeners and that could be how they're discovering you. Um, and by filling out these forms, you're tagging the mood genre on, in Amazon's case, you're mentioning up to three artists that you sound like. Um, so you're getting very specific and you're making sure that that music is going to get delivered to the right people on Amazon. Mm. Um, on Spotify, because you filled out this form so far in advance, you're going into release radar for everyone that follows you, the artist. So if you have 500 followers, that's 500 release radars that song is going to go into because you submitted that form early. And um, the cutoff for that is seven days prior. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're doing this three weeks out from release. So we're giving plenty of time. Um, you know, and then two weeks out is when I would start talking about it and teasing it. And, mm. um, you know, not just posting an image and saying, go pre-add my new single. Um, like, give people something. Mm. You know, like, I, for lack of a better word, tease them a little. Yeah. You know, have, like, I've seen some artists do this, like, in dance music specifically, where they'll have the build-up right before the drop, and then there'll be, like, a crash with a delay and an echo, and it fades out. And you're just like, what was the drop going to be? <laughs> I, you know, and, and then, you know, you, you see the comments and everyone goes crazy. And then they're That's like, a great idea. Free out of if you want to hear that first. Yeah. Um, you know, can or I, if, Mike, sorry, can yeah. I interrupt you for a second? I want to just go back to the pitching. Who yeah. is accepting pitching right now? It's Amazon and Spotify. Uh, is Apple or Tidal or anybody else open to pitches? So... Good point. Um, Apple, not right now. Um, my suggestion for Apple and other platforms that don't have a public artist-facing form is check with your distributor. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is that some of the distributors, even you know the ones that um, have unlimited uploads per year, if you start digging through the help centers and the FAQs, you may find that they actually do have a form where you can submit to ask them to help with your release. Wow. Just be very selective about this because you can imagine if this is a distributor that has millions of artists, mm -hmm. you may only get one chance to put something <laughs> forward to the people that are actually having conversations with these platforms. But if you've got that track, you you think it's the one, you completely believe in it, um, and you've got a plan in place, bring that to them and they may jump on board and help. Um, for Tidal, Last year, in well, December 2023, for two weeks, they did a public test, which was kind of low-key. Um, they posted on their socials a couple of times, but they opened up playlists um, or editorial and playlist pitching mm -hmm. for two weeks in December. And artists could go in there and submit music, recent music, new music. Um, and, of course, they got a lot of submissions. So that gives me hope that, 
that may come back in the future. And, you know, I would say for artists, if you're wanting that, let them know. Sure. Um, you know, Tidal are really active on social media. Um, they've built out their artist home now, which is also known as Tidal for Artists. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and the way that I found out was I logged in to Tidal Artist Home and on the right-hand side of my dashboard, I saw this pop-up window that said, playlist pitching wow. submissions now open for the next cool. two weeks. And I just dived in and yeah. Um, of course, then I just double checked to make sure that this is showing for everyone. And as soon as it was, started telling That's everyone, awesome. here's your chance. You've been yeah. asking how yeah. to pitch the title. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, when what's you're uploading to your distributor and and potentially pitching through them, and I know that everybody has a different type of distributor and relationship and and level tier level with their distributor. But when you're pitching, or sorry, when you're uploading, you've got the file, the artwork. I, I presume the lyrics. A lot of distributors ask for lyrics. Is there anything else you're doing with your distributor when you're getting everything ready for your release? Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like this could have gone into uh, week four when we first uploaded. So <laughs> it's um, okay. <laughs> it's okay, everyone. We're just going to jump back in time slightly <laughs> here. Um, but yeah, so when you're uploading, that's a really good point. Uh, lyrics, if your song has vocals, um, including the lyrics with your distributor is key. Um, lyrics aren't just for fans who want to follow along as such, um, you know, there's a lot of things now like Apple Music Sing, which is a um, real-time synced lyrics, like a karaoke function. Yeah. Uh, and then lyrics are also really good for discoverability, meaning there's platforms like Music's Match, uh, Lyric Find, and a number of others where if you also log in, in most cases it's a free account, and upload your lyrics, They'll push them to places like Google search. So there's stories of artists that have been discovered by people who were trying to find words for a speech at their wedding, and <laughs> it ended up serving up lyrics from a song they've never heard, and they ended up connecting with those lyrics and using that as their wow. wedding dance. You know? Wow, um, that's really cool. Yeah, so yeah. Um, it's, it's an SEO thing. Obviously, I'm not saying release a song that drops 200 name brands in the track and, and try and game it. But I'm saying you've already written that. Like there's people that could connect with those lyrics yeah. as much as when they hear the actual music in the song. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they also get delivered to all of the other services. Like pe when people use their voice and say, hey, play the song that says, I just took a DNA test, turns out I'm 100%. And then you get Lizzo plays, you know. Right, right, um, right. That's true. So you're really making it, because I'll be honest, a lot of my favorite songs right now, I'm yet to know the name of the artist and the song title, but I uh -huh. could tell you enough of the lyrics that I could That's find right. it. That's right. So, um, you know, people could hear your song while they're in the other room in their house mm -hmm. and they can, mm -hmm. they remember part of the lyrics. Um, they can go back and request that later and find it. Um, in addition to lyrics, there's a couple of other things that you can do. Um, with Apple, they have what's called Apple Motion that they've been rolling out. So what this looks like is in any of the Apple Music apps, an album cover, instead of just being a still image, there'll be some movement in there. Mm. Um, and it's really subtle. It's not meant to be a movie within, <laughs> yeah. know, within the album cover. But in some cases, let's say it's a picture of you know us at the park, maybe a bird flies across and flies back or something subtle like that. Right. Um, and Apple also have Apple Motion for the top of artist profiles. So that, um, you know, one example for anyone that's listening and wants to check is the artist uh, Kate Renata. At the top of his profile in Apple Music, it will have him walking along back and forth, um, showing off his kicks and like leaning down in and like looking at you while you're looking at his profile. And it's really fun. That is cool. And it looks really cool on Apple TVs because the resolution right. they ask yeah. for is crazy. Like the <laughs> file size is massive, but it looks great on big screens or small yeah. screens. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. That So that's kind of like their... 
response to um, Canvas, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And with that, you know, I, I say check with your distributor because everyone will have different processes, but uh, the distributors will be the ones that will tell you what they need and you will send the files to them and then they will pass that on. Oh, okay. Um, That's not something you can upload in Apple Music or Ar yeah. Apple Music for Artists? Or Especially when you see the file sizes you're dealing with. I, <laughs> I, can, I can understand why they don't want everyone uploading directly yeah. and then having yeah. to assign someone to check for quality control. Oh my gosh. Um, I should mention as well that Tidal also have... Um, so similar to Apple Motion, Tidal also have Tidal animated art. Um, in this case, it's just album covers or actually single covers, basically any release. Um, you can have a, a cover that moves as well. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and it, you know, it can be the same as the one that you deliver for Apple Motion. Um, the file size for Tidal is significantly smaller um, right. in most cases. You can attach them in an email. They're so small. Are they um, movie files? Or are they GIFs? Or how does it work? Uh, yeah, they're movie files. Oh, okay. So, okay. That's cool. I, and it's like, obviously looks pretty seamless, like, because it's looped, right? Yeah. So that's one of the keys is it has to loop perfectly, which means the first frame and the last frame of the video need to be exactly the same. Whatever okay. happens in between happens, but... Okay. Um. So... One example is um, there was an artist that had a, a Christmas album and the album cover was static on most streaming platforms. But when you would look at it on Apple or Tidal, after a few seconds, some snow would start <laughs> dropping down. I think I saw artwork. it. I think I saw yeah, it. Yeah. And then it would stop. And then a few seconds later, the snow would start again. So it just looks like it's snowing on and off. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's a perfect loop. That's incredible. I yeah, and that's a great way for people to do that with old titles too, right? Like, just take yeah. the the old album cover and put snow on it. That's incredible. Oh my yeah. gosh, I like yeah. that idea. Honestly, as a music fan, I I I kind of like canvases and I kind of like the Apple Music's motion things. It kind of re grabs my eye. Like it's 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 really weird. It's I, I imagine the whole thing is is for psychological purposes, just to kind of like remind you that you're in the app, you know, and not to move away. Well, to give you an idea, if you open the Spotify app on your phone, towards the very top left of the screen is a video tab, mm. like before music or anything else. And you tap that and it's just an endless feed of um, canvas, of clips from artists where they've recorded short clips, right. um, or just artwork with uh, samples of songs and playlists. Um, you know, and yes, it's discoverability, but it's also to keep you in the app and to help you find what you're looking for. So, you know, I think it goes both ways. It's well, you know, as a streaming platform, our goal is to keep people here as much as possible for the listener. It's, I don't necessarily always know what I'm looking for. Help me find something cool. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think with Apple, with Apple Motion, with Tidal, with their animated art, with all of these apps rolling out these features, it's a way to get us looking at the screen again. And, you know, I, honestly, um, I think it's also competing with voice because you think about how much now we have um, assistance in our headphones, in our cars, in those speakers, in our, our lounge room, even in our computers where we can ask for music by name. When you're looking at the screen, you almost need something a little more entertaining than just a list. Um, yeah, yeah. And, Interesting. Yeah, and you know the other thing as well is, I you know when you go into a music store, back in the day, <laughs> when you go into a music store, you would look at the artwork, and yeah. from there you would decide, do I want to listen to this? You know, um. And I don't think that's changed. Like if I'm looking at the app and I see some artwork, I'm like, that looks interesting. Press play. You give, give it a chance. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, I remember those CD samplers, like the wall of those, um, you know, I can't remember the brand, but like they would have like, they'd be on the wall and they'd have a CD or a multi-CD changer with headphones. I, I spent yeah. hours at those things. 
So, um, okay, let's let's fast forward. Let's go back to T minus two weeks here ish. Yeah. Um, is pre saving still a thing? Um, I, let me do, let me tie that into two two questions. I also want to ask about putting together these one pages. These like um, uh, I, I don't know what you what you call them, but those link pages. Like I I, I was introduced to a company called Hyped It this past year, and, and I've used yep. their, you know, where you basically plug in the Spotify link or or you grab it from your distributor and they find all of your platforms all in one little hub. I think those are great. Um, are those still a thing? Tell me about setting those up. And then also in the same conversation, tell me about pre-saving. Um, is is that something that you would ask your fans to do pre-save on, on any of the platforms? Yeah, so smart links and pre-saves. Let's touch on smart links first. Um, Smart links, definitely. The reason being that you you have something coming out, that link will roll over when it goes live as well. So that link won't change. And you're giving fans the option. You're saying, here it is. How would you like to access this? You know, would you like to pre-add it on this platform, pre-save it on this platform? Would you like to get an email when it comes out? Would you like to, you know, whatever it is. Like yeah. you've got everything covered in that one menu. Um, as far as pre pre ads and pre saves still being relevant, definitely. Uh, I would say even more so now. So years ago, the only way that you could do this was there were third party tools that weren't created by the streaming platforms, where you would log in and you would give access to part of your Spotify or Apple Music, Deezer, etc. Um, you would give access to your account so that they could go in and save the album on the day that it comes out. Which scared a lot of people, right? Scared a lot of fans. Like, you know, it's, I mean, people don't normally read the terms and conditions, but when you see this screen and it's saying, we want access to your library, your listening habits, your name, your email address, so (laughs) that we can save this. That's a big ask. So, um, (laughs) and, um, you know, some people would go and, you know, take advantage of that. You know, they could make you mm. save a hundred albums. They could make you follow a bunch of playlists. Right. Uh, in some cases, they could make you listen to music that you didn't listen to. Um, Crazy. You know, very rare cases, but sure. yeah, you yeah. can understand why giving that much access was concerning. Yeah. Um, so what's happening now is, um, you know, there's been some artists where we've seen Spotify have rolled out countdown pages where it's in the app, it's native. And when the album is pre-saved from a fan, they'll get access to some extra videos, maybe a bonus track, maybe the full track listing, and there's a countdown. And, you know, it's building excitement. Yeah. Um, That hasn't rolled out for everyone yet. uh, But, you know, the hope is that after they've tested it with a few more, which they're doing publicly, that, you know, that will be a feature for artists. That sounds um, that sounds really cool. I like that. Yeah. And then Apple Music. Um, so for anyone that's familiar with iTunes, and iTunes still exists, by the way. Um, <laughs> if you don't see it, just go into the preferences in the Apple Music app on your computer and turn it back on. Yeah. Um, but for anyone that's familiar with iTunes, where you would set up a pre-order back in the day. Yeah. Um, you've been able to do this for years, where you've been able to set up instant grat or instant gratification tracks which basically means hey pre-order my new album that's coming out later this year and you immediately get access to these three or four tracks right you can listen to them right now you can download them you can stream them you can put them in your playlist um that still exists but because of itunes and apple music it will actually cross over between both which means if you pre-order the album you get the downloads If you go into Apple Music, those songs will be available to stream and you can pre-add the entire album to stream as soon as it comes out. Um, Wow. And of course, the key thing here is that there's no additional sign-up. It's in-app, it's native. But also, you have to think about it. Apple are now seeing how many people are pre-adding that album prior to it coming out. So if a large amount of people are pre-adding that album, they're now seeing that. Yeah. So, um, whereas before, if you were using another tool, um, a third party tool, they would see all of those ads on release day. Mm, so, mm. you know, it's, 
I'm really excited about this direction that it's going because it means that, you know, if it means even more now because fans can go in and pre-add, pre-save in advance uh, and on the back end they can see that at these platforms. So that's you know, really know that people are actively. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't realize. Oh, so the fans would be able to see how many pre ads they get in Apple Music. Ideally, ideally, it's not showing in the back end at this yeah, time. Ideally, yeah. Well, no, that I'm is fine. really cool. Yeah. And I didn't know that because that was something I always coveted, and I was always asking my distributor to set up that pre ad because it was really only major releases that had that ad- advantage in Apple Music, iTunes. Yeah. Uh, That was available to us for quite a while. But yes, in Apple Music. And one of the things that was, because basically for a lot of us, we would upload an album to our distributor. It would stay hidden until release day. Even And and so let me ask you this then. If I upload my album to my distributor, okay, 10 song album, it's coming out in four months from now. And I set the pre-sale or the pre-release to two months ahead of schedule, ahead of the album. Yeah. Um, if I release two pre-release singles in the next, in the first two months leading up to the album, I'm using the same waves, the same ISRCs, maybe a unique um, artwork because they want unique artwork. Will those songs be instantly become the instant grat on that album? Like, how does that connection made? So they won't show up on the album as instant grat, even okay. if they are available and released. Okay. So there's, you know, there's just one extra step there, which is tell your distributor, Hey, I want this song, this ISRC on this album to be made available as instant grat on this date. Okay. That's so that's something your distributor has to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought. And that that's kind of a bummer. That seems like it would be nice for us to be able to schedule that when we're setting up our release. Yeah, I mean, it may change in the future, and some yeah. distributors may have a, a an easier solution for that. You're right. Um, but you know, in my experience, I mean, I've you know, I, I work with a distributor in my day job, but I also have used many other distributors as well. And um, you know, I, I find that when you email them, they know exactly what you're talking about when yeah, you want to set right. up instant grat. That's true. They'll they'll give you a copy paste with exactly what they need. You respond, and that's it. You know, that's it's it. it's not yeah. like it's a question they don't get often. They know exactly yeah. what you're asking for. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, okay, let's so let's talk about playlists and pitching to playlists. And one of the things I'm curious, I mean, okay, so we've talked about the 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 editorials and pitching to the algorithm and discover through Spotify. So w- we can maybe touch on that again uh, if there was little tips and tricks that I I know I don't know about, but. When we're yeah. talking about UGPs, user-generated playlists, and we're talking about third-party playlists, uh, when is that happening? On our little four-week timeline here, for me, I've always pitched using Submit Hub or Groover. I've always pitched on release day or yeah. a day or two after release day. Usually, the f- release day Friday, I, I'm pitching because I want the song to be available. So somebody listens to it and goes, this is great, I'm going to put it on my playlist. I don't want them to have that idea a week before the song is out because they're going to forget to put it on the playlist or whatever. So uh, when are you doing that pitching? Like, what's the ideal time to pitch to user-generated playlists? Exactly the same as you. And the reason for that is these user-generated playlists, this is not their full-time job. Yeah. You know, they they do this when they have time. So that window of opportunity on a Sunday afternoon where they're listening to music, make it as easy for them as possible. Yeah. Which means... The song is already out. They have the link. They can just drag it straight into their playlist. Some of these platforms, they can actually click a button and it will automatically place it in their playlist if they choose to place it. Um, so the less clicks, the less work, the less back and forth, the better. You know, some of them won't even send you a message and tell you they added it because they're just going through trying to listen to as much music as they can right. and place what they like. Right. Um, so, Yeah. Release day or any time after that is best for those, for sure. And one other thing I would add, um, and I can't believe I didn't mention this before, is Pandora. So Pandora only exists in the United States, and it has existed in other countries before. And I feel like a lot of artists overlook it because it used to be available in their country or it's not available (laughs) where they live right now. 
But the reality is they have 60 million monthly listeners. It's still within the top five streaming apps in the United States. Wow. And anyone that's trying to reach an audience in the US, that's a significant amount of people that you could be reaching sure. if you pay a little attention to it. Um, so they have their artist marketing platform, which is AMP for short, yep. um, where you can sign up from wherever you are in the world. So, you know, you're in Mexico, you're in Australia, you're in the UK, you can still sign up, get access. Um, and they have what's called featured tracks. And I should mention, this is provided directly from Pandora. They don't take any royalties. There's no payments involved. Um, but what this does is it allows you to feature up to six tracks per year, eight weeks per track. So 48 weeks out of the year, you can have music being featured in Pandora. And the submission process, um, all that they ask is, what's the UPC of the release? Um, if there's multiple tracks, which track are you putting forward? When would you like this to start and end? And you've got eight weeks for that. Wow. Um, and for the track, it just has to have been released within the last year. So you're doing this after the song is live. Um, and it has to have had 10 streams in the last seven days. <laughs> and I know some people say, hey, that's easier said than done. Um, Pandora actually have a playlist called Fresh Cuts that the artist team curate. And basically, when your song goes live, share the link to it from Pandora and you can get it in the back end um, because, you know, you may not have the app. Um, and tag them on social media, whether it's Instagram, X, whatever you use. And a lot of artists are seeing that their song is getting placed on this Fresh Cuts playlist, which is a mix of new music from artists that are active on Pandora, and they're getting those 10 streams, sometimes more, and then they're able to feature that track. Interesting. And when the featured track goes live um, for those eight weeks, what Pandora do is uh, they put it in their endless listening modes or radio modes or essentially you're listening to a similar artist and that album finishes and they keep serving music. They never stop serving music that they think you'd like. And um, through that, you're going to get heard. They're putting you in front of an audience and they're looking for feedback. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Are people listening to the song yeah. in its entirety? Are they skipping early on? And you're getting streams from that. So I've seen some artists get a few thousand streams over those eight weeks. And then, of course, I've seen artists get incredible, incredible numbers. And, you know, not just the streaming numbers, but it converts to monthly listeners. It converts to people placing it on their own playlists and stations in the platform. And, um, you know, can it's I can incredible. I ask you two questions about Pandora? This is huge. Yep. Um, I appreciate it. Can I ask you two questions? Number one is um, I remember a time when I used to have to upload my music to Pandora to be considered. Is Pandora getting the songs from your distributor, like your traditional digital distributor? Okay, so there's two parts to Pandora. And this is, I'm glad you mentioned this, because this is another thing why I feel some people may overlook it. Um, and I'm going to go back in time quickly. I'll keep this okay. short. But okay. Pandora has been around for a very long time. Yeah, for and sure. And they've always been human curation, first and foremost. Um, yes, the music is served endlessly, but they have originally to get music on Pandora, you would mail them a physical CD. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> and they would listen to the CD. And if they liked what they heard, they would go and purchase the album from iTunes. Then they would ingest it into Pandora. Wow. And then every track would be tagged with, they refer to it as the genome project, but essentially every track would be tagged with up to um, see, there's up to 600 individual characteristics that they can apply to a track wow. to make sure that it's going to match the right set of ears. Yeah. And so, you know, this goes beyond genre. This is mood. This is intensity, instrumentation, everything. And this sure. was being done by humans. <laughs> so um, because of that, a lot of people say Pandora's curation is really strong. It feels like a human's actually listening. You know, you're not getting served something weird in the middle of, yeah. A station. Um, and it's because of that. And so fast forward to now, obviously they opened up 
um, the platform so that they have uh, on-demand listening similar to Spotify and the others where you can listen to any album you like, you know, directly. Um, but to be considered and available in their station programming and all of their other programming, there's one extra step which allows you to reach more people because those humans need to listen. And um, so in AMP, once you've signed up, in the top right corner, there'll be a menu and there'll be submit music. Um, and once again, you just enter the UPC, choose the tracks that you want to submit. Um, you can include a few details if you like, and then a human listens to it, tags it accordingly, and it starts spinning in their stations as well. So, um, and then of course, you know, um, adding to that the featured tracks and things like that, you can yeah. really start to get moving on Pandora and reach a lot of listeners. But yes, initially, you will need to do that extra step and submit the music. Like it's still going to be available to stream on demand in Pandora, thanks to your distributor. Right. But beyond that, to be to be discovered in their programs and things like that, you need to submit it so a human can listen and tag it accordingly and put it out there. That's so good to know. And then how are you being paid? Are you being paid in two different ways? Because I remember because they were non-interactive or one side of their business is non-interactive, it was coming in through like radio royalties through uh, sound exchange, which yep. is great. Um, and then I imagine there's like some of the more interactive streams are coming through your distributor. So how are you being paid from Pandora? Correct. And, you know, so there, the radio side is being treated as radio. Mm -hmm. Sound exchange or or others will collect that for the artist, and then the other side, the on demand, um, you know, that is being paid through the distributor in most cases. So, right. um, you know, if you like, if you Google it, there's stories of artists that signed up for Sound Exchange and got significant checks from Pandora and, of course, other platforms because they didn't realize that, you know, <laughs> those those li those listens, those plays were actually coming from radio. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's that's a whole nother conversation about <laughs> royalties and, and missing royalties and things like that. But yeah, definitely um, for Pandora, Sound Exchange or, or others and your distributor to make yeah. sure you're getting paid from both. That's great. That's very helpful. I appreciate that. And that's, you know, it is, I don't know, I can't speak for our listeners, but... I, I forget about Pandora all the time. And funny enough, it was the first quote unquote streaming or internet radio or digital music consumption tool. And it was available in Canada for a very quick minute. And, you know, people, friends of mine, non-musicians, non-people in the music industry were saying, you got to check this thing out, man. You just enter one artist, one song, mm -hmm. and then that type of music will not stop playing. And people were raving about it, and then it, uh, you know, it disappeared and never came back. But I think a lot of us just forget about it or overlook it. Yeah, and a lot of people speak lovingly about it still as well, sure. and they miss yeah. it. And, yeah, um, well, sixty million—that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, one other thing I'll just add with Pandora please. is, you know, they're also tied in with a lot of business radio um, oh, or in-store okay. music as well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There are different providers out there that will actually tap into Pandora's library to program music for hotels, spas, restaurants, uh, businesses. So, um, you know, it's it's beyond just that streaming platform. You, you could also lead to music being played in businesses, which is again a whole nother conversation. But yeah, yeah. I'm glad we br I'm glad we brought Pandora up um, because yeah. you know, I don't play favorites, but they are one of the biggest here. Um, mm. and they're overlooked by so many and that's For why sure. it's so important to keep talking about them as well. So the other question real quick about user-generated playlists, are you are you doing a, a concentrated effort? Might you spend a certain amount of money on those uh, pitching platforms we talked about? Um, maybe you have a list of UGPs that have been supportive of your music in the past. Like what is your, um, what is your, user-generated playlist strategy for your new single? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think it's being selective is more important than just blasting out to a large amount I agree. Of yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I don't 
like I'd love to still have time to listen to everything that people want to share with me and curate, but I had to sort of step back from that to focus on doing things like this. Yeah. Um, you were one I of the had... OG UGPs for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Work hard playlist art. I mean, yeah, for sure. I would submit through your website or maybe yeah. submit hub apps, probably pre submit hub days. I was submitting to you, wow. I think. Yeah. You know, and, um, I still get emails today with song pitches for playlists that I don't even think are uh, exist anymore. <laughs> Those um, emails are from me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But um yeah, you know, I mean the the ones that are going to work best are the ones where you know I I mean let let's simplify it. If you have a spreadsheet, whether you use Airtable, Excel, whatever you use to be organized, whatever you like staring at, yeah. Um, yeah. you you have a very easy list. It's name, email, maybe a link to the blog, and some notes. And every time you release a new track, you'll look through the notes and it might be, hey, thank you so much. You placed this track that I released last year. Um, yeah, I've got point. the next track. I just wanted to share it with you. It was one of the first. Um Go to those people because they've not just because they've supported you previously, but it's a way of thanking them with new music, you know, showing them that you appreciate what they've done for you True. and you wanted to share it with them first. Um, and then, you know, going through that list slowly over time, you know, the extras that you're pitching, whether it's Submit Hub or whoever you're using, um, others will start to come through. Like, and one thing I'm always, Con I was always considerate of when I was pitching is um, that the email you send today, they might read it two years from now, hmm. you know, um, and they'll probably read every email since. So how you communicate is going to yeah. be there permanently. It's like in print. <laughs> like, yeah. So, um, you know, just put some heart into it, make it For a sure. little more personalized, you know, um, it's, Otherwise, it's just going to be, hey, here's my new track. Hey, here's my new track. Hey, here's my new track. And that's all they're going to see. Whereas some of the best cases I've seen is each one is like a story. So it's like, hey, I wanted to share this with you. It's my latest track. I wrote it about this. And then the next email is, hey, so since the last track, this happened and I ended up writing about this. And oh, cool. um, all of a sudden, you've gone back through those emails and you've caught up. And, you know, um. It, it's like that on any platform, like that DM that you send to someone, they may not get it. It may go into their other folder and then two years later they see it. Um, so just think about that um, before you press send, like just take 30 seconds, make yeah. it a little more personalized. Um, and not only that, but instead of trying to do a blast out to thousands of people, um, you know, be selective, like, I would I would rather write an email to ten people that is personalized. Where yeah, I completely. I've agree. listened to their playlist. I have heard some songs on there that are similar to mine, and you know, show that you've actually listened and done some research first. That's going to go a long way for sure. Um, because it goes both ways. Like if you become someone that gains their trust, and every time you send them music, it's relevant and it's good music you're going to start to become top of the list. They're actually going to start looking for your name in emails. I Is there still strength in, in user-generated playlists? There was a time, and and you, uh, I have so many questions for you. We're running out of time. But um, <laughs> is, there, is there still strength? Because I know that like there was rumors that the platforms were trying to deprioritize them to prioritize their own playlist. They didn't like how much control the, the user generated playlists like your yours were 10 years ago. Um, I know that some people will get on all of these playlists through Groover or Submit Hub, but then when it actually comes down to it, you look in Spotify for artists and they maybe didn't generate any plays at all, or maybe just under 10 plays. It wasn't even worth the 50 cents to pitch. So like what's happening with UGPs? Are they still... I, like, should they still be a big part of your strategy? Yeah, so it's kind of two parts to that. I mean, I straight up, I still think they're very important. Um, yes, there is significantly larger amounts of them now than there were when yeah. we first started out. 
Um, but you know, the the number of people working at these streaming platforms curating now, sadly, has gotten smaller and the amount of music getting delivered has increased. And um, you know, I I think that, you know, I mean, if you ask everyone out there that has a Spotify or an Apple account, how many playlists do you have? They're usually going to say more than one that they've created for themselves. Right. Um, but that being said, like what I'm seeing now is almost a resurgence of people that are getting really active on socials. Like mm-hmm. you go on TikTok and you see people out there that, um, you know, are put as talking about a specific genre of music that they love. And then they have a playlist and it's editorial level or higher in terms of how many people are following and listening and engaged with it. Um, so I think, you know, these playlists are still relevant, but it's not enough to just have a playlist that exists anymore. You need to be singing about it. You need to be mm. talking about it um, the same way that you would about your own music. Yeah. So for artists, it's actually a great opportunity to say, hey, when we're not releasing music, we can still have a playlist where we highlight music from ourselves and other artists and we can talk about that on socials. You know, Instead of just posting about our upcoming track that's coming out in six weeks, let's highlight other artists that we love and tell people about our playlist where we add music from those artists and grow the following on there. And, you know, um, I've seen, I've seen a lot of that happening lately, which, which I think is incredibly valuable. Um, and also it helps with the algorithm because you have a playlist with a lot of people listening to it and all of these artists are, you know, getting, um, put together in this cluster um, so that when people listen to one of them, they're likely to get the others served as well. Good point. Yeah. Let me ask you real quick about YouTube and YouTubers. Um, what should we be aware of? Because, you know, I have a lot of tracks that have been featured by YouTubers. A lot of these like UGP playlist people are actually pursuing a YouTube channel. They find it to be more sexy. I think there's monetization options for them if they have deals with the artists or even if they don't have deals with the artists. Uh, or they just want uh, a silver play button. So tell me a little bit about what we should, as artists and labels, be cautious of. Because, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities. Sometimes they want to offer you cash for the to whitelist their channel uh, mm-hmm. and to do all sorts of things with their music. In some cases, they just play your music, you whitelist their channel, or you don't and your distributor collects from them. Um, what do you know about that and what should we look out for? Yeah. And I mean, these have existed for a long time. And um, honestly, a lot of these YouTube channels, let's say, for example, the ones where they go, hey, we love your track. We want to upload it. Um, but can you whitelist it? You know, we are going to make the money on who listens to it on on the upload that we host. Um, a lot of those channels ended up launching labels and playlists on streaming platforms and things like that. So yeah. Um, you know, what I found was that with my own music, we allowed some YouTube channels to upload it. Obviously, we didn't get any money from that, but they also had strong playlists on various platforms and they placed our song on there. Now, they weren't getting a cut from that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And that actually helped us to get discovered by a lot of listeners um, because they were a reputable YouTube channel, um, you know, turned label. Um, so we looked at it as, you know, this is free promotion as opposed to, oh, this is someone making money from something we've created. Um, And not only that, but, you know, they're investing a lot of time and in some cases money to grow that channel and grow that following and grow the following on those playlists. So um, we were happy to do it, but, you know, it's going to come down to the individual, whether they're comfortable with that or not. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's but a net, pos- me, I, it's I a net positive. It's incredibly think? valuable. Yeah, yeah. I, I do too. Sometimes I get, I start, I get some emails that I, I get a little spooked, but because I'm like, man, you it sounds like you want quite a lot of rights, you know, to my tracks, right. and and I just, you know, I get a little spooked. The other thing I noticed too, um, I was uploading something to Symphonic the other day. And I noticed that if you ask them to whitelist a channel, they have kind of like a and and I can't speak too much because I really don't know what I'm talking about here, but they have a certain uh, threshold of channels that they're willing to whitelist for you because mm. it cuts into their revenue, right? Because right? 
because they take a percentage. So if you if you do like an off platform deal with YouTube in cash with a, a YouTuber and you whitelist their channel, then you're cutting out that percentage or whatever that your distributor was taking. I never thought about that. And I mm. thought, oh, that's gonna that could be a problem down the road. Yeah. You know, that's an interesting one for sure. Um obviously every distributor will be slightly different with how they handle it. Um but yeah, I mean also just as far as managing goes, like if you're whitelisting for hundreds of channels, maybe yeah, maybe there has to be a better solution. Yeah, like exactly. A, a free for all, basically. Like, hey, you can use this, but it has to be credited in the description yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean that that whitelisting procedure has been a, a pain in the butt, and and it's, I mean, it's just a double edged sword because on one hand, I really like having uh, my distributor collect on my behalf for a lot of those rogue posts, and and sometimes it's like. It's just a, a, a little kid will upload your song to their video of their dog running through a field with five views. And yeah. then there's these massive platforms with a million followers who are uploading my whole album with artwork and they're getting, you know, a hundred thousand streams on my artwork and on my album. And, and it's like, yeah, it's nice that they linked to me and I probably sold vinyl because of it. Um, but it's, you know, it, I can see how many things I need to whitelist. I like people kind of looking out for my music too. You know, uh, it's a weird, it's weird. It's very weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, my, my sort of take on all of this is I look at being on streaming platforms and being on video platforms uh, the same way as social platforms. Like I go, uh, I'm not on there to make money from them. I'm on there for people to discover me, discover my music. And then it's on me what I do with that after, you know, how do I convert them to my mailing list? How do yeah. I convert them to come to the show? How do I convert them to buy a vinyl? Um, you know, I, I'm not saying that like, you know, I definitely feel like artists should be getting paid more from all of these platforms. Absolutely. But for me to, to just, maintain my focus as an artist like i have to look at them differently i have to look yeah. at them and go this is a place i need to show up and this is a place that i'm on but i'm not going to be looking to see how much money i'm getting from them because it's just going to distract me from creating <laughs> and focusing on everything else i want to do as an artist yeah so um no that's good advice and i now you're saying that i feel I am reminded that I've I've been failing to up to keep up with my mailing list and bringing people to my mailing list because it's it's always been so easy when I find a way to capture their emails and then to pitch to them on a new album when I, a new album comes out it's like that mailing list is way more receptive than any other marketing tool I have yeah. and I haven't touched it in a in a couple of years and I need to get back at it um yeah now so now you made me feel bad but <laughs> <laughs> That well, that wasn't the goal, but um, <laughs> no, it's good get advice. That email out there. It's good advice, Mike. I gotta let you go. There, I have another hundred questions, but we'll save it for next time. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And I, I was just thinking about the last time you were on the show. This might be your third time. I can't recall, but um, the last time we were talking, you had some like funny little workaround for contacting Starbucks via their Twitter or something, and. I just think it's so funny because I know a lot of people will like hear this and then they'll go and do these tricks. So Pandora is going to be bombarded today and everyone's going to be, you know, implementing your these little tricks. And that's what I love about them. It's not just like generic advice, do this, do that. It's actually saying, listen, go and find their email, go and ask your distributor specifically for this. It's like very, very practical, tactical ad advice. So thank you for that. My pleasure. And you know, I mean, these are all things that are within reach. These aren't things that are only available right. because yep. of good point. What I do or good who point. I know, like, yeah, and that's why I put this out. Um, so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to catch up with you and and to share this. And I hope everyone gets value out of it. Uh, what's what is uh, what do you want people to check out? I, I I don't know if I do a good job at 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 pitching you and 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 your thing. But do you have anything that that you can pitch for us now? Yeah, I mean, everything that I've put out, like whether it's little things that I've created or written about or recorded or whatever, um, 
you know, or upcoming workshops that I do in person at like South by Southwest and places like that. Like if you want to come hang out, um, you can find out everything at askmikewarner.com. It's all on the one website now. Askmikewarner.com. Okay, we'll link yep. to that. And the book is still uh, still a bestseller, Work Hard, Playlist Hard, second edition. I imagine you're probably thinking about third pretty soon, eh? Oh, yeah. 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 All right. um, no and I'm question. open to suggestions uh, as, as to whether I should change the title or not. Um, so if anyone wants to, to get in touch on socials, um, I'd love your input as well. It's a great book. It's it's very very helpful, and and uh, we had the first edition on on the show years and years ago. So so always great to chat with you. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, Scott.